1. Martha Alice Mertz. Mertz was last seen in Lancaster, Pennsylvania at 8 p.m., on June 22, 1961. That evening, she got into a heated argument with her husband of 11 years. He left their apartment, in the 40 blocks of West Vine Street to get some cigarettes, and when he returned, she was gone. When she failed to return home that night, her husband went to see Mertz's brother, who ran the furniture business where she worked. After borrowing from him, Mertz's husband drove to West Palm Beach, Florida to visit his sister and cool off. Meanwhile, Mertz's sister in Lancaster reported her missing. She had left home multiple times, before after disputes with her husband, but would always contact a relative. This time, she was never heard from again. Another resident of the apartment building, had overheard the argument between Mertz and her husband the night of her disappearance. The witness said it was no different than other arguments she'd overheard, and that she hadn't heard anything to indicate physical violence. Mertz's husband stated she took a suitcase with her, but he was unable to tell the police what clothing items were missing and a new outfit she had recently purchased was left behind. A close friend of Mertz's said, Mertz had confided that she was tired of the constant arguments, with her husband and that someday, she would leave, and no one would know where she was. She left behind her last two paychecks, and her vacation pay, and never touched her bank accounts, which contained a total of about eight to nine thousand dollars. The money was distributed to her heirs, when she was declared legally dead seven years later. Little information is available as to Mertz's fate. Her disappearance remains unsolved. 2. Jeffrey Michael Bratcher On June 15, 1974, Jeffrey and his family spent the day in Ocean City, Washington. The children went to play, and were told to be back by 7 p.m. for dinner. Jeffrey was playing with five other children, in a section of the park during the day. They were told that dinner would be prepared at 7 p.m., and they were to return to the adults' area at that time. Jeffrey told the other children that he would take a different trail back to the picnic area when dinner time arrived and separated from the group. The picnic area was about 150 feet from the shore. Jeffrey never made it and has not been seen since. His mother had full custody of all the children at the time of his disappearance. Jeffrey's parents called the police and a 72-hour search ensued. Authorities brought police dogs in and they traced Jeffrey's scent to the park's entrance. However, it vanished at the edge of the pavement. There is very little info on this case, but I wanted it on here anyway. I usually do not do that, but I could not help it when I saw Jeffrey's face. It's unclear where in Ocean City the family was picnicking, as there are several sites, it appears. If this was a kidnapping, it had to be a moment of opportunity, because Jeffrey had been with his family up until he decided, for whatever reason, to take a different trail than his siblings. Once he was separated from them, he vanished. The picnic area was about 150 feet from the shore, and an extensive police search of the park area didn't give much insight into what happened to Jeffrey. Search dogs may have located his scent leading up to the park's entrance, but it disappeared at the edge of the pavement. Sadly, authorities believe Jeffrey was either abducted, or that he fell into the ocean and was swept out to sea. To this day his case remains unsolved. 3. Marie Simonia Wade. That year on my birthday, July 11th, was the last time Marie Simonia Wade was seen. The 19-year-old Los Angeles, California resident went missing without a trace, and since that time her story has either fallen through the cracks or, like many, has been collecting dust on cold case shelves. The only information that has been made public is the date of her disappearance and one grainy photo to help identify her. Other than that, there is nothing else known about Marie's last moments, or encounters that day. If you don't have any information to share, then why report on her case at all? You may ask. Well, just because we don't have details about Marie doesn't mean that the mystery around her disappearance is invalid. She was just a teenage girl whose family and friends haven't been given any sense of closure in decades. Not only that, no one has talked about her in that amount of time, either. I'll be reporting about many, Marys, young, old, and in between. There are thousands of cases of women, whose missing person reports only include a name, and a date late seen. Not even a photo. Wouldn't you want someone to continue looking for, and reporting about you? Marie was born in 1963, and is described as having brown hair, and brown eyes. In 1983, she was 5 feet 6 inches and 125 pounds. It's believed she was wearing purple shorts and black sandals when she went missing.
There is no information on what kind of top, sweater, or jacket she was wearing at the time. If you have any information regarding Marie's disappearance, or think she looks familiar, please contact the Los Angeles Police Department at 213-896-1800. Share this story to continue the conversation about Marie Simonia Wade. She is our sister, and her life matters. 4. Chantal de Montgaillard. Indeed, Michel Baudoin and Jean-Paul Prince, the two investigators who collected the confidences of Michel Derry following his arrest on August 20, 1983, were met by the cold cases of the Sûreté du Québec. In addition to officially resolving the disappearance of Chantal de Montgaillard, the specialized investigators would try to determine in which places Michel Derry was, between 1972 and 1983, as well as since his arrest in the event, that he would have attended halfway houses following his stay at the Pinel Institute. In this way, one wishes to verify whether it can be linked to other assaults, disappearances or unsolved murders. A work that began more than 35 years ago. It should be noted, that in the months which followed the summer of 1983, Although Michel Derry was detained following the kidnapping and death of Milani Descamps, the investigators of the Sûreté du Québec, Michel Baudoin and Jean-Paul Prince, have continued to investigate. This is how they learned, that at Voltageurs Park in Drummondville, previously, a little girl had gone missing, but had been quickly found. The woman who had her child abducted, did not file a complaint with the police, because she was with her lover at the campsite. By filing a complaint, she would have been forced to say who she was with. Michel Derry, he was the one who kidnapped that little girl, asserted unambiguously Michel Baudoin, when met in the spring of 2018, by the author of these lines. Also, in 2018, during a telephone conversation, Jean-Paul Prince also recalled having met Michel Derry, in Sherbrooke Prison during the trial. We brought out all the unsolved cases in the region, and the surrounding area. There is another case, that emerged in St. Hubert, Chantal de Montgaillard. A discussion will lead Derry to confess, that he abducted the four-year-old girl as a teenager. According to what he indicated to the investigators, on June 4, 1972, he had taken her to a little wood, behind a church in St. Hubert, had tied her up after, a teen arbor, but had not had her. Not killed, according to her. With the exception of the location, it is a scenario that bears a resemblance to that of Milani de Camps. At the time, the experienced police officers Michel Baudoin and Jean-Paul Prince obviously validated the veracity of this confession. You should know that, in this type of criminal case, there is information that is never communicated to the media. One of those, in the case of Chantal de Montgaillard, was the color of her underwear. He gave us the color of Chantal de Montgallard's panties and that was correct. When the investigation was carried out at the time, in 1972, he had not been met, as Derry's parents had moved to St. Leonard d'Austin a few days later. The body has never been found. Indeed, there was a small wooded area behind the church, but it was cleared to build houses. We spoke to the Crown Attorney, but since he was acquitted in one case, it wouldn't have helped much to accuse him in another. And apart from his statement, and his knowledge of the color of the underwear, we had nothing to corroborate, disclosed Jean-Paul Prince in 2018. Since then, between 1983 and today, in light of the ongoing investigation by the Sûreté du Québec, it seems that little Chantal de Montgaillard will not be allowed to fall into oblivion for a long time. Perhaps, in passing, we will find answers to other disappearances, or murders unsolved for more than 37 years. A bomb, which could not be more desirable, for families in distress. 5. Francis Tachito. Tachito was last seen at her home in the 10 block of Commerce Drive in Portland, Connecticut on June 1, 1953. She has never been heard from again. She left behind five children. Few details are available in her case. I was unable to find any details about the circumstances of her disappearance on any of the missing persons databases so I started digging around to see if I could find out anything about her. Namus states that she was missing part of a finger as a result of a factory accident, while working at Russell Manufacturing Company in Middletown, Court. A still unmarried Francis L. Macklin first appeared in the Middletown City Directory in 1928. Francis, who was residing at 327 High Street, was the only Macklin listed. Due to the fact that she would have been in the 18-20 age, range in 1928, I would venture a guess that, 
She was in Middletown for the purpose of attending Wesleyan University. On a side note, her address of 327 High Street was also the residence of its owner, Louis de Coven Hubbard. Hubbard was a prominent member of society, a textile businessman, whose ancestors had settled in Connecticut in the 1600s. Louis de Coven Hubbard has been mentioned in news articles across several states. After Hubbard passed away in 1934, his property at 327 High Street was sold to Wesleyan University by his heirs, and was later converted into an infirmary for the school. I do not know if Francis was somehow related to this man, or just rented a room from him, or maybe even worked for him. At some point in 1928, or 1929, Francis married Joseph V to Cheeto. They moved around Middletown throughout the 1930s, showing up at a different address nearly every year. Around 1940, they moved into this home at 17 Commerce Drive, in Portland Court. Joseph and Francis had several children during the 1930s, some of whom were married themselves, by the time Francis went missing in 1953. The 1940 census states that both Joseph and Francis were born in Connecticut, although I cannot find any sign of her on any earlier census. There were a couple Macklin families in Connecticut at the time, but obituaries of those families do not mention anything about a Francis. For that matter, neither does her husband's. Francis' husband, Joseph, died suddenly in Middletown, in March 1956, at the young age of 49. He never remarried. In fact, his obituary is the only indication of her being missing, outside of her sparsely populated missing person form. Not that she is mentioned as such, but the fact that she is not mentioned at all leads me to believe that the family weren't sure how to list her, surviving or not, so she just wasn't mentioned. This happens quite a bit in the obituaries of parents of missing persons. Newspaper searches haven't turned up any mention of her disappearance. I wish I knew more, if she seemed unhappy, if she had planned to go anywhere that day, what type of marital situation she was in. Of course, logic would say that she's deceased now, as she would be over 100 years old, but that's not the point. Her children have been missing, their mother for 60 years, and I'm told time, and time again by families of the missing, that it does not get any easier with time. I'd like to see a resolution for them, and a proper burial for her, if she has not received one. As far as I can tell, all but two of the Tachito children are still alive, and I do hope one of them will submit DNA, so that she can be matched against unidentified remains. Without DNA, it would be particularly difficult due to the fact, that we have no photograph of Francis. If you are a member of Francis Tachito's biological family, Please contact the University of North Texas Health Science Center at missingpersons at unthsc.edu, or contact your local law enforcement agency, and offer to submit DNA. It's easy, just a saliva swab, and it can make all the difference. 6. The Lisbon Ripper Cold Cases The cold case about the serial killer, that plagued Lisbon in the 90s will forever remain unsolved, and has become an everlasting mystery taunting the Portuguese authorities. The victims of the Lisbon Ripper were all young, short brunettes, HIV-positive sex workers, and drug addicts in their 20s. According to psychiatric profiling, the Ripper was, apparently, a normal person, living a discreet social life. Like many other psychopaths, he could be the next-door neighbor that helps you carry the groceries up the stairs, as you wouldn't find anything weird about him. However, his mind was full of demons that taunted him into sociopathy, concocting a negative view of the outside world. The Lisbon Ripper exhibited all the signs we commonly find in psychopaths. The forensic analyst José Barra da Costa is one of the leading theorists regarding the case of the Lisbon Ripper. The expert found evidence that leads him to classify the perpetrator as a psychopath with schizoid traits. The forensic profiler describes the Ripper as an impulsive and aggressive man, unable to feel any empathy. Adding to the mystery around his identity, the researcher explains how the murderer should be vindictive and turn to himself, hence exhibiting signs of sociopathy leading to social avoidance behaviors, while maintaining his relationships at a superficial level. The Ripper profile fits what pop culture identifies as the serial killer leitmotifs. A self-centered white male, at the time, 30 to 35 years old, revealing deep feelings of anger, hatred, and resentment directed towards women, especially those who fell into his ideal type of victim, developed over the years, in the course of which he created and perfected his fantasies. Case 1. 
Maria Valentina. The young woman, 22, was a sex worker and, despite her young age, a seasoned drug addict. According to the police report, her mauled, eviscerated body looked as if a rodent of great size had chewed it. There was a large hole on her abdomen, and around 2.40 meters of intestines laid scattered around. The entire colon of the victim was missing. The forensic report states that the cause of death was asphyxia, and there's no rat on earth that could do that to a person. It was a different type of rat that eviscerated Maria. The serial killer murdered and gutted two more prostitutes, the last one in March 1993, and disappeared without a trace. In 2008, after 15 years, the crimes were time-barred. Case 2, Maria Fernanda. The human rat was back. The victim, 24, a gambling addicted that, spent at a local casino most of the money, she made in sex working at a local casino. The mother of two was found in a shed, under the Entrecampos railway line in Lisbon. The modus operandi, M.O., made bells ring on the mind of the police investigators handling the case. Lisbon had a serial killer on the loose, and it wasn't a giant rodent. The crime scene was even grislier than before. The victim had her head smashed. Then she was brutally gutted from stern to lower abdomen. The ripper removed both her breasts, and finally disemboweled her. The ripper was building up a sadist self-confidence. Fernanda's torso exhibited cuts near the heart and pelvic organs, including a laceration on her uterus. And out of the victim's body, Inspectors had to collect the lungs, liver, gallbladder, stomach, and part of the small intestine. The large intestine was not found, as was the colon, again. Case 3, Maria Joao. The third and final victim was 27-year-old Maria Joao, from Santo Antonio dos Cavaleros, who lived alone with her two cats. By now, dear reader, you have noticed the pattern. All the victims had a common first name, Maria. According to the coroner's report Jose Sombrerero, the Ripper's profile fits a loner, with no relations to his victims and above suspicion. I can't entirely agree, with the, no relations to his victims, part, as this seems too far-fetched. How could the Ripper, have pinpointed all his victims only killing women called, Maria, sex workers, HIV positive, and drug addicts? This doesn't add up, and there's still another intriguing twist. Maria Joao was a friend of, Tina, the first victim. On March 15, 1993, her body was found 100 meters, from the site of the first victim. Maria Joao was strangled, gutted, cut open, and had the same internal organs removed, as the second victim. Still, this time almost all the organs were removed, including the victim's lungs. According to the coroner, all the victims were alive, when they were gutted but unconscious, after being bashed on the head by the ripper, who then proceeded to tear out several internal organs. The killer acted late at night or quite early in the morning. He didn't try to conceal the bodies or the victim's identity, as their faces were kept intact. The Lisbon Ripper crimes committed from 1992 to 1993 were time-barred. According to the Portuguese Penal Code, any of the crimes that occurred, prescribe after 15 years. Thus, even if the murderer is exposed, he cannot be prosecuted or tried, let alone imprisoned. For years, many believed the Ripper was alive, and dwelling in the vicinities, of the places where he so hideously murdered three young women.